Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to convene the committee today for an important nominations hearing. You are all before us to represent the United States in key posts overseas in the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa. And we want to collectively thank you for your willingness to serve the American people in this administration. Um, we're going to make brief opening remarks, uh, and then we'll turn it over to our nominees uh, for your remarks, and then we'll engage in a series of, of dialogues. Ms. Uh, Escraminga, the United States has a distinctive partnership with Oman as a country that plays a really important role in mediating different disputes and conflicts in the Gulf, especially when it comes to Iran and Yemen. I was there a few years ago pushing the Omanis to take a more active role in midwifing peace negotiations in Yemen, and today it's more important than ever before for our ambassador to Oman to support that back-channel role. Ambassador Johnson, you're headed to Lebanon, where the economic and political crises continue to deteriorate. As I told you privately, our Lebanon policy has helped prevent collapse, but we have to admit it has not been successful in prompting the political elites to make the compromises necessary to rescue the economy, your job will be to help us think out of the box as to how we allow Lebanon to make a major leap forward. Mr. Masinga, the brutal conflict in Ethiopia's northern Tigray region was the world's deadliest conflict in 2022. All sides committed war crimes and crimes against humanity. While many Ethiopians in the international community welcomed a preliminary peace deal signed by the federal government and the Tigrayan authorities in November, significant challenges in the peace process lie ahead and other simmering conflicts remain unaddressed. Mr. Hunt, there were mass protests in Sierra Leone last summer, and the skyrocketing cost of living continue to drive unrest there. At least 20 civilians and six police officers died in those clashes, with the economic situation still dire and political tensions running high ahead of elections next month, working with our partners and allies to help prevent more violence there will be critical. And finally, Ambassador Pop, you are nominated to lead our post in Uganda. A lot to talk about with respect to Uganda, uh, but their parliament just passed one of the most extreme anti-LGBT laws in the world. that puts LGBT individuals in Uganda in great danger uh, and may embolden other countries in the region to crack down on those rights as well. The world is watching. We look forward to talking to you about that important topic. Uh, I'm looking forward to discussing how all of you are going to represent the administration and advance our U.S. interests and safeguard U.S. personnel abroad. We thank you all for being here today, for the sacrifice you're making on behalf of the country. And with that, I'll turn it over to the ranking member, Senator Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our five nominees today for their uh, distinguished careers in public service to the United States, both at home and abroad. The positions for which you've been nominated represent the front lines of American diplomacy in increasingly challenging times. I look forward to all our nominees today explaining their vision and plans for advancing American leadership and interest at their respective posts. In Oman, our engagement with this strategic partner must continue to further U.S. interests in finding a sustainable peace in Yemen, reasserting clear control of vital sea lanes, and not permitting Iran the space to undermine security and stability in the region. In Beirut, our goals are increasingly undermined by prolonged political stasis supercharged by Hezbollah and public corruption and economic collapse. Nor can we forget the massive arsenal of increasingly sophisticated munitions Hezbollah has trained on Israel. In Ethiopia, our ambassador will immediately be responsible for reasserting American leadership and pursuing accountability in a country recently torn apart by horrific conflict, a conflict fueled in part by regional actors. Our ambassador in Kampala will be tasked with moving our bilateral relationship beyond one of humanitarian and security aid and towards a U.S. position that actually pushes back in attempts by strategic competitors to swallow that country whole. And our ambassador to Sierra Leone will represent the U.S. in a country with immense potential, but a need for sustained political and economic growth and stability. So all of you have your work cut out for you, and each of you will have a different perspective on what American leadership and engagement means for each of the posts you've been nominated for. I look forward to our discussion today, and thank you again for your willingness to continue serving the United States. Uh, let me provide brief introductions, and then I'll ask you to all make opening statements in the order 
of introduction, ask you keep your opening comments to five minutes or less. Your full statement will be made part of the record. Uh, Ms. Uh, Anna Escramiga currently serves as the general counsel at the U.S. Consulate General in Montreal. She has previously served our country in a variety of posts, uh, mostly in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Algeria, Iraq, and Syria. Ambassador Lisa Johnson is the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs. She has previously served as an ambassador to Namibia from 2018 to 2022, coming before the committee for a second time. Mr. Irvin Masinga is the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary in the State Department's Bureau of African Affairs. He previously served as a United States Trade Representative, Trade Policy Officer. His postings overseas have included Sudan, Guinea, Chile, and the Dominican Republic. Mr. Brian Hunt, serves currently as the Senior Policy Advisor to the United States Transportation Command at the Scott Air Force Base in Illinois. His career in the State Department has a long list of overseas posts, including Mozambique, Guyana, Papua New Guinea, Pakistan, Guinea-Bissau, and Botswana. And finally, Ambassador William Pop currently serves as our Ambassador to Guatemala. Uh, again, a second time before this committee, previously serving in Brazil, Kenya, Colombia, Angola, and Nicaragua. Welcome to you all. Look forward to your testimony and to engaging with you over the course of this hearing. Turn it over to you. Chairman Murphy, Ranking Member Young, and distinguished members of the committee, it is my honor to appear before you as President Biden's nominee to represent the United States as Ambassador to the Sultanate of Oman. I am grateful for the trust that the President and Secretary Blinken have placed in me. I want to take a moment to acknowledge my father, Pedro Escrojima, and my mother, Ana Fernandez, immigrants from the Dominican Republic and retired career public servants from the great city of New York. My siblings and my brother-in-law who are here today and myself, we all admire their example of courage, of conviction and dedication to family. I wanna thank my husband, Hussam, my partner on this exciting journey, which became more exciting with the arrival of our one-year-old son, Pedro, I understand that our little guy is watching on screen along with grandma and grandpa, although he may not exactly realize what is happening. Senators, I have spent most of my career in the Foreign Service in the Middle East protecting the interests and security of the American people. If confirmed, I would draw on this experience to advance U.S. values and national security interests in Oman. I will work every day to ensure the safety and well-being of our Mission Oman team and the American citizens working, traveling, and studying in Oman. The warm and enduring U.S. relationship with the Sultanate of Oman dates to the earliest days of our republic. We established commercial relations 190 years ago in our first trade agreement with an Arab state. Today, the U.S.-Oman Free Trade Agreement supports American jobs and drives bilateral trade, which reached a record high of $4.2 billion in 2022, a 30% increase from the prior year. This February, Oman hosted the inaugural U.S.-Oman Strategic Dialogue, where we pledged to build our economic relationship for the future. We have a strategic opportunity to support Oman's economic diversification toward renewable energy, manufacturing, and logistics sectors. We signed a $500 million Exum MOU that will support American companies seeking to be a part of that transition. If confirmed, I will work with our Omani partners to grow trade and commercial ties and build opportunities for our countries to innovate, contribute to global energy security, and create further prosperity. Now, the bright and prosperous future we seek in the region is only safeguarded if we can address the security challenges that affect Oman and its neighbors. The Gulf is vital to key U.S. national security priorities and the Sultanate of Oman has consistently been a valued partner in advancing those priorities. Together, we have worked to disrupt Iranian weapons smuggling and pursue peace in Yemen, which has seen the longest period of calm since the war began. We partner with Oman to address security challenges in the Strait of Hormuz, through which 88% of the region's oil transits. Since 1996, Oman has hosted the Middle East Desalination Research Center, the longest functioning regional integration mechanism that includes Israel. If confirmed, I intend to build on these solid foundations to explore further avenues for deepening regional integration, prosperity, and security. I will focus on countering Iran's destabilizing actions and on advancing concrete strategic alternatives to the PRC's aggressive practices in the region. 
I will encourage Oman to build on its announcement permitting Israeli civilian overflight through its airspace by taking additional steps, including consideration of full normalization with Israel. We are in an exciting moment in the U.S.-Oman people-to-people relationship. We recently announced the resumption of the Fulbright program for Omanis and a new partnership between Oman and the Arizona National Guard. If confirmed, I would support exchanges that advance shared priorities and bring together students and experts to take our relationship forward into the future. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to your questions. Chairman Murphy, Ranking Member Young, distinguished members of the committee, it is an honor to appear before you today as President Biden's nominee to serve as U.S. Ambassador to the Lebanese Republic. I would like to express my gratitude to the President and Secretary of State for the confidence they have shown in me. If confirmed, I look forward to working very closely with this committee and with Congress more broadly to advance our nation's interests in Lebanon. Please permit me to acknowledge my parents and my brother, without whose steadfast support I would not be here today. I'm deeply grateful for their encouragement, as well as that of mentors, colleagues, and dear friends during my more than 32 years serving the American people at home and abroad. If confirmed, I would be honored to return to Lebanon, where I had the privilege of serving from 2002 to 2004. During that time, I gained a deep admiration for the vibrancy of the Lebanese people and a sobering appreciation for the challenges they face, including endemic corruption, poor governance, and Hezbollah's continued threat to their country's sovereignty and security. Unfortunately, Lebanon today stands on the brink of collapse, battling what the World Bank has described as one of the world's three worst economic crises of the past 150 years. In this, the Lebanese people bear the costs of their leaders in action. Lebanon's leaders have failed to implement critical economic reforms required for an IMF program, the country's only realistic path to recovery. They also have yet to elect a president and form a government, depriving the Lebanese people of leadership when they need it most. The way forward is clear. Lebanon must elect a president, form an empowered government, and implement long overdue reforms. If confirmed, I look forward to continuing U.S. efforts to support the Lebanese government and Lebanese people every step of the way. I'm grateful for the strong bipartisan congressional support for the Lebanese Armed Forces and Internal Security Forces as trusted partners in maintaining Lebanon's stability and security. Since 2006, we have provided more than $3 billion in security assistance enabling these forces to strengthen Lebanon's sovereignty, mitigate instability, disrupt terrorists, and counter Hezbollah's false narrative that its illicit weapons are necessary to defend Lebanon. We also remain committed to UNIFIL's mission and to the safety of UN peacekeepers, who continue to play a critical role in diffusing tensions in Lebanon. I'm heartened, too, by the substantial U.S. development assistance we provide to the Lebanese people. For example, last year we provided over 100 million U.S. dollars to support the Lebanese private sector, enhance service delivery, and improve access to education. Importantly, we also provided over 400 million dollars to critical humanitarian assistance for the most vulnerable, including both Syrian refugees and vulnerable Lebanese. The way ahead for Lebanon will not be easy. I am all too aware there are entities that stand in the way of progress in pursuit of self-interest. As demonstrated by our recent sanctions designations, the United States remains committed to fighting corruption in Lebanon, which I will continue to prioritize if confirmed. I also am clear-eyed about the threat Hezbollah poses to Lebanon's sovereignty and stability, as well as to the United States, to Israel, and to the wider region. Recent U.S. sanctions against financiers, drug traffickers, and a sanctions evasion network all demonstrate the United States is committed to targeting those with Hezbollah ties. If confirmed, I will continue to pursue all tools to advance U.S. counterterrorism objectives. There is, however, cause for optimism. Lebanon's recent conclusion of a historic maritime boundary agreement with Israel, brokered by the United States, demonstrates what the country's leaders can achieve if they set aside partisan and personal interests and put those of the country and Lebanese people first. If confirmed, I look forward to invoking that same sense of unity and purpose to press Lebanon's leaders along the path to both political and economic recovery. Finally, as a former ambassador, I know well that advancing U.S. interests is a team effort. If confirmed, I would be honored to lead Embassy Beirut's talented, dedicated, diverse team of American and Lebanese staff whose safety and security, along with that of the more than 40,000 U.S. citizens residing in Lebanon, will always be my top priority. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today, and I look forward to your questions.
Thank you very much. Uh, just before you begin, let me welcome uh, Representative Slotkin to the committee today, I believe here in support of her friend, uh, Ms. Uh, Eskrahima. Thank you very much for being here. Senator Murphy, uh, Senator Young, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you and to answer your questions on my nomination to be the United States Ambassador to the Federal Republic of Ethiopia. I thank President Biden and Secretary Blinken for this tremendous opportunity to serve my country and my wife, Lorene, for helping to make all of this possible in countless ways. My story is like all Americans, with my family having many different origins, from my mother's roots in Louisiana, where her parents and grandparents worked tirelessly to establish an educational foundation for later generations, despite the enormous challenges of that era, to my father's parents and grandparents who struggled with the Portuguese colonial regime in what is now Mozambique, I'm deeply humbled today to appear before the United States Senate as an ambassadorial nominee. My parents themselves provided clear guidance and instilled bedrock values that I have aspired to emulate from discipline, integrity, and treating with people with kindness and respect. Public service has always been a hallmark in my family from my mother's national level leadership in the social services arena to her father's service in World War II as in a refinery and her mother's service as a school principal. If confirmed by this body, I pledge I will do my utmost to live up to those values and models in leading this important diplomatic mission. My career includes challenging tours in China, Latin America, and leadership roles in Guinea, Sudan, and Washington, all of which have reinforced my core belief that there is no higher calling than to serve my fellow Americans and to also mentor the next generation of foreign service professionals. Mr. Chair, the United States seeks a trusted partner in Ethiopia, a country significant not only for its strategic location and growing population, but for its economic potential, as well as its prominent role in history and the global community. The last two years have tested our bilateral relationship. The conflict that began in late 2020 wrought horrific violations and abuses upon the citizens of Ethiopia. In response, as required by US law, the United States placed restrictions on our foreign assistance and suspended Ethiopia's trade benefits under the AGOA, Africa Growth and Opportunities Act. But our diplomatic engagement never faltered. And to the credit of the Ethiopian federal government and the Tigrayan regional authorities, they left the door open to our efforts to seek a peace agreement in concert with our partners, notably the African Union, Kenya, and South Africa. The November 2022 cessation of hostilities agreement silenced the guns. And I am deeply proud of the role the Department of State played in facilitating that outcome. We continue to focus on supporting the implementation of that agreement, be it through human rights monitors, uh, humanitarian assistance, or transitional justice but more must be done to ensure peace in Ethiopia is durable. I believe we must be ready to support Ethiopia in all ways that further our own policy objectives. Chief among those objectives is security and stability in the Horn of Africa. Historically, Ethiopia has been an exporter of stability. For example, being one of the largest global contributors to UN peacekeeping operations. But instability within Ethiopia, notably Aromia, threatens to destabilize the region. We welcome the recent announcement of government talks with the OLA, and we stand ready to facilitate those discussions if asked. Ethnic tensions persist and youth unemployment is high, now exacerbated by the need to demobilize thousands of soldiers following the cessation of hostilities in the north. Investment in the country's democratic and economic reforms will address the root causes of conflict, including economic and social fragility. At the same time, we need to ensure there is accountability for the atrocities committed during the conflict. That's key to ensuring true reconciliation and durable peace. To that end, we should support Ethiopia's nascent transitional justice efforts. Transitional justice is a key part of any country's path to, from war to peace, and Ethiopia will be in urgent need of international support and technical expertise as it seeks to heal, pursuing it the key transition justice elements of truth-telling, accountability, reparations, and guarantees of non-recurrence. We should support these efforts, not just out of a commitment to peace and, and human rights, but also because a durable peace in Ethiopia will promote security throughout the, the Horn of Africa, making Americans at home and abroad safer. Finally, we should be clear-eyed about our primary mission in any overseas embassy, to protect and serve U.S. citizens. In that context, I echo the thanks extended to the government of Ethiopia for enabling the evacuations out of Sudan. I am proud to make it my mission to ensure U.S. citizens in Ethiopia can expect the highest level of attention and service that they deserve. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Young, and members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to appear before you as President Biden's nominee to be the next U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Sierra Leone. 
I would like to thank the President and Secretary Blinken for the trust they have placed in me with this nomination. If confirmed, I will work closely with this committee to advance our nation's partnership with Sierra Leone. For more than two decades, it has been my honor to serve as a member of the United States Foreign Service, oftentimes in dangerous and austere locations. I could not have done so without the love and support of my family and friends, many of whom are here today. If confirmed, I look forward with their help to once again strive to advance U.S. interests in Africa, a region of the world on which I have focused much of my career, and one which I believe has the potential in the coming decade to play an even greater role on the world stage, provided the democratic aspirations of its young and vibrant population are met. The Republic of Sierra Leone has demonstrated that democratic progress is possible. Since the end of the country's devastating decade-long civil war in 2002, and with sustained support from international friends, including the United States, the people of Sierra Leone have rebuilt, maintained peace, and most importantly, hewed to a democratic path through four rounds of national elections that were broadly judged to be free and fair. Next month, Sierra Leoneans will once again head to the polls, and much more important than the political outcome will be the manner and environment in which this latest electoral contest is conducted. A free and fair election that is competitive, inclusive, and held peacefully is essential both for the prosperous future that the people of Sierra Leone desire and for an expanded U.S.-Sierra Leonean partnership. If confirmed, I will ensure that support for democracy and good governance remains at the forefront of the Embassy's work with the goal of helping Sierra Leoneans institutionalize their democracy and ensure it delivers. Despite progress, Sierra Leone ranks 181st out of 189 countries on the UN's Human Development Index. The 2014 to 2016 Ebola epidemic and the COVID-19 pandemic have stressed a health system already struggling with high rates of maternal mortality, child malnutrition, neglected tropical diseases, and malaria. Sierra Leone made effective use of U.S. health security investments to fully vaccinate 70% of its eligible target population against COVID-19. Its government should, however, continue to allocate resources to the health sector, not only to protect its own citizens, but also to sustainably safeguard the region and the broader international community from future disease outbreaks. If confirmed, I will work with Sierra Leonean leaders to ensure that public health remains a top national priority and that U.S. funding is used effectively to complement Sierra Leone's own efforts. Sierra Leone has made progress in establishing a market-based economy and has taken steps to protect workers' rights. U.S. investment in and trade with Sierra Leone has the potential to advance prosperity both for Americans and Sierra Leoneans. If confirmed, I will work closely with the U.S. business community to advocate for reforms that enhance Sierra Leone's ability to attract high-quality foreign investment, including through regional market integration, while simultaneously using trade development tools to help ensure U.S. businesses remain competitive in the Sierra Leonean marketplace. I hold paramount the safety and security of the hundreds of U.S. citizens resident in Sierra Leone and the entire U.S. Embassy team, including U.S. citizen employees, their families, and our Sierra Leonean colleagues. If confirmed, I would do everything within my power to ensure their security and well-being. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, members of the committee, I am committed to working with you all to advance American interests overseas. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you, and I welcome your questions. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, members of the committee, it is an honor to appear before you as the President's nominee to serve as the next United States Ambassador to the Republic of Uganda. I would like to begin by thanking my family, particularly my wife of 24 years, Milena, and my daughter, Alicia Pilar. I'm grateful to them for joining me in the privilege, joys, and sacrifices of serving our nation overseas. As a career member of the Foreign Service for more than 23 years, I've been honored to represent the United States in seven overseas assignments across Africa and the Western Hemisphere, including as our current U.S. Ambassador to Guatemala, as well as serving in Washington. And in each of these duties, I have advanced U.S. interests, promoted our democratic values, and worked with host nations to achieve shared goals. If confirmed, I believe this experience will be valuable in leading our mission, advancing bilateral goals with Uganda, and furthering our regional objectives. 
Our relationship with Uganda has advanced important U.S. interests over the years, including working together through PEPFAR and other U.S. health programs to save millions of lives from HIV AIDS, Ebola, and other health threats. We have likewise strengthened regional security and counterterrorism, including in Somalia. Uganda, with U.S. assistance, currently provides protection to more than 1.5 million refugees and asylum seekers who have been forced to flee their home countries in East and Central Africa. We've also faced challenges, including human rights violations and limited democratic space. These challenges impact not only Uganda, but also the United States' interests in a freer, more prosperous, and secure region. If confirmed, I will work steadfastly to advance U.S. interests and values and to pursue security, prosperity, good governance, and democracy with Ugandans. First, we must protect our citizens' security. This includes cooperating to fight transnational criminal organizations, countering violent extremism, and strengthening border security. It also includes effectively preventing, detecting, and responding to health threats, addressing food insecurity, and supporting climate resilience. Second, we must broaden prosperity for both countries through sustainable economic growth, mutually beneficial trade, and formal job creation. With one of the youngest populations in the world, generating opportunities for Ugandan youth and women is particularly vital. U.S. assistance is an important part of the solution, but so is working with the public and private sectors to create an enabling environment for businesses to thrive and support entrepreneurship. If confirmed, I will seek to create more opportunities that generate jobs, support U.S. businesses, and assist entrepreneurs. Third, rule of law, transparency, good governance, and respect for human and labor rights for all are essential for Ugandans to achieve the full potential of their democracy. U.S. engagement can help build the capacity of public institutions to deliver services to the Ugandan people. And working with civil society, the private sector, youth leaders, and innovators, we can foster prosperity, opportunity, and integrity. A more just and equitable Uganda will spur investment, stability, and development for all Ugandans. We also will continue to support the equal protection and non-discrimination of members of all minority groups. In addition to pursuing these objectives, if confirmed, I will make protecting the thousands of U.S. citizens living and traveling in Uganda my highest priority. I will also lead the more than 600 U.S. and Ugandan professionals in the U.S. mission to advance our bilateral and regional agenda by creating a safe, equitable, and respectful workplace. And I will vigilantly safeguard resources and maximize the effectiveness across U.S. agencies to build a brighter future with Uganda. I also commit to working closely with you and the other members of the Senate, members of the House of Representatives, and your staffs. Thank you for the honor to appear before you today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you all very much for your testimony. We'll start a round of five-minute questions. I'll start with you, uh, Ambassador Johnson. I enjoyed our conversation together. I wanted to give you just an opportunity to expand upon your comments regarding um, the status of uh, the Lebanese Armed Forces. Every time I go, uh, I am more and more impressed uh, at the capability of the armed forces and their willingness, often at great risk to themselves, to put themselves in between the factions inside that country that often are very close to coming to significant long-term conflict. Um, they have stood up for protesters, um, protected the right of people to, um, uh, to provide their, their views, um, and they also um, you know, are really one of the few things that stands in between Hezbollah having even more control of the insecurity environment than they do today. Maybe I'm making the case for you, but tell me if you agree with my assessment of the Lebanese Armed Forces and the reasons why we have had good bipartisan support for continued funding to keep them operational. Uh, thank you very much, Senator, and I, I greatly appreciate your, your deep interest in Lebanon and support for the Lebanese Armed Forces and Internal Security Forces, as well as the bipartisan support of, of Congress for that purpose. Um, I, I share your view. Um, we have spent a, a lot of funding on security assistance for the armed forces, uh, developing them into a professional and capable force capable of meeting any threat in Lebanon. Um, specifically, we've bolstered the capabilities to defend Lebanon's territorial integrity, to mitigate instability, to combat terrorism, to uh, dismantle drug trafficking smuggling networks, to preserve, maintain law and order. Uh, they've carried out these missions uh, very well, as, as you've noted. They're, they're a quite trusted partner for the United States with actually an absolutely exemplary and use monitoring record um, in terms of the way they keep track of the assistance that we provided to them. 
Um, I'm very proud to continue partnering with them. And one of the most important things uh, in, in supporting the Lebanese Armed Forces in particular is that uh, it really undermines Hezbollah's narrative, their false claim, that their weapons are necessary to defend Lebanon. As we continue to see the Lebanese Armed Forces deploy effectively to meet really any threat, uh, it, debunks, it debunks that claim and, and lays it bare. So uh, if confirmed, I would continue to advocate for very strong, um, robust security assistance to the Lebanese Armed Forces and internal security forces. They're doing a great job of, of bolstering stability and security in this part of the world at a very difficult time for Lebanon. Thank you very much. Ambassador uh, Pop, um, the attacks on homosexuals and LGBTQ individuals in Uganda are frankly extraordinary. Um, the parliament passed legislation in March um, that goes further than making same-sex relations punishable by life in prison, which is an effect of the 2014 law. It now creates a new offense of aggravated homosexuality that is punishable by death and by making the promotion of homosexuality punishable by up to 20 years in prison. It would criminalize failing to report knowledge of individuals engaged in homosexual conduct. I guess I'm interested that you didn't mention this in your prepared testimony. Um, and I'm worried that this sort of avoidance in your testimony of this extraordinary piece of legislation that's sitting in front of the president's desk for signature as we speak is a signal of an intent to deprioritize this issue because it might upset the Ugandan government. Um, can you clarify your opening remarks? Um, and can you tell us what the U.S. response will be uh, if the president signs this law? Yes, Senator, thank you for the question. And by no means, uh, by not mentioning it in the, the testimony, am I deprioritizing de it. I would say that I share your concern. It is a very troubling uh, piece of legislation. It is not yet signed, as you noted, but it is something that uh, is very uh, threatening, not only to members of the LGBTQI community in Uganda, but frankly, to all Ugandans. Uh, the implications and potential impact of this legislation, if signed and enacted, could have major negative repercussions for all Ugandans that are interested and need access to medical care, health care, uh, particularly uh, individuals who may be HIV or AIDS positive. Uh, but also the impact that it could have, uh, frankly, on Uganda's rep international reputation, its uh, ability to attract investment, uh, tourism, uh, and frankly, uh, the opportunity to advance as a democratic society that includes all Ugandans. So uh, when I mentioned in my uh, testimony, obviously, that we must continue uh, to support all Ugandans and prevent discrimination, uh, that is certainly uh, included in the element of LGBTQI and the Anti-Homosexual Act. I, I appreciate that. Um, I don't think it's enough to raise the general concern about fair treatment of individuals, uh, regardless of sexual orientation, race, ethnicity inside Uganda. I think you've got to space, pay special attention to this um, just abnormally vitriolic and dangerous attack on LGBTQ individuals, and I appreciate your clarifying statement. Senator Young. Uh, Mr. Masinga, the Ethiopian economy has shown uh, significant growth and potential. But it's also uh, faced certain structural challenges and, and socioeconomic disparities. How would you support Ethiopia in advancing sustainable economic development, uh, attracting investments, and, and fostering job creation? And how can these efforts be used to leverage accountability measures for the role of members uh, of the government in, in Tigray conflict? Senator Young, thank you for the question. Um, if confirmed, um, helping Ethiopia and the Ethiopian people and economy get back on track, back on the track that we saw prior to the most recent conflict, would be uppermost in our object uh, amongst our objectives. Uh, the government, prior to the conflict, had engaged in uh, a thorough set of reforms designed to enable the country to continue moving ahead. Um, uh, uh, forcefully on the economic side in telecommunications, banking, logistics, et cetera. That was derailed by, to a great extent by the, the current conflict. And in the current context, 
the macro economy is struggling uh, with the immense costs uh, imposed by, by the conflict. We look forward to working with the, the government, the people, uh, the business community to reinvigorate those, um, those reforms and those, those, those processes. And as the American ambassador, I would be honored if confirmed to uh, ensure that our model, our growth model, the Western growth model, the American growth model, uh, would be one that um, the people of Ethiopia would recognize would be uh, useful, if not uh, essential for growth forward. Um, it's no secret that there are others around the world, other major econ economies that are interested in Ethiopia, that are interested in investing in Ethiopia. Um, our growth model is the, the strongest one for long-term growth, and I will be um, steadfast, if confirmed, in ensuring that the people of Ethiopia recognize that. Thank you. And among the countries uh, uh, that uh, is, is no doubt interested in, in uh, supplanting the United States, certainly competing uh, uh, against uh, the influence of the United States, uh, in Ethiopia is China. In fact, Ethiopia is a central hub for China's uh, Belt and Road Initiative to the tune of some $4 billion. Uh, what potential risks and challenges do you perceive in Ethiopia's increasing economic reliance on China? And how would you work to mitigate any negative consequences for Ethiopia's long-term development and, and sovereignty? Senator, thank you for that uh, following question. Um, again, uh, China is deeply invested in, in, in Ethiopia and is looking to continue that investment. Um, as we've seen in many countries around the world, that investment is not cost-free, nor is, is that model uh, the most appropriate model for long-term growth. And, Senator, uh, if confirmed, I look forward to working with the Ethiopian business community and, um, and government to ensure that they understand the costs associated with that. Are, 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 are there... Um, are there government agencies, U.S. government agencies, regional partners, international organizations uh, that you would regard as best place to help uh, address and, and perhaps counterbalance some of the malign influence of, of uh, China and other adversaries in the country of Ethiopia? Of course, within the United States government, uh, Department of Commerce, um, uh, uh, USTR, um, other specialized agencies in telecommunications yeah. certainly would be part of all that. And, of course, the international community would also be uh, essential to help um, demonstrate to the Ethiopian people and the government that that model really is the, the best way to, to go forward. Of course, some of those agencies who, who hopefully have a presence uh, in, in the embassy, right, which is a good thing. Uh, <clears throat> Ambassador Johnson, uh, China has been expanding its, its Belt and, and Road Initiative, of course, globally, as we just mentioned in Ethiopia, but uh, Lebanon signed on to that initiative in, in 2017. Are there any ongoing or proposed uh, BRI projects uh, that you're aware of in Lebanon that you believe could have negative long-term implications for the United States, our partners, uh, or our interests? Uh, yes, Senator, thank you very much for the question. Yes, Lebanon did sign on to the Belt and Road Initiative. However, uh, my understanding is that there are no significant Chinese investments in Lebanon. Um, we continually reiterate with our partners concerns, uh, risks of deeper engagement with China, of problematic, non-transparent financial and infrastructure investments. Uh, that was very much a focus for me in my previous role as ambassador to Namibia, and I can assure you it would be a priority for me if confirmed to, as ambassador to Lebanon. Thank you so much. Senator Kane. Yes, sir. Thank you, Senator Young, and, and congratulations to all of you nominees. It's a really well-qualified panel. Um, Ambassador Johnson, I'm, I want to drill down on the aspect of your testimony where you talked about the severity of the economic, really economic political challenges facing Lebanon right now. Sometimes in this committee and on the Hill, there's a debate about, okay, how does it affect us? How does it affect the world, the internal challenges in Lebanon? Should Lebanon continue on the path that it's on, a downward spiral characterized by a challenged economy, a lot of refugees, the inability to organize a government? Uh, should it continue on that path? What are the consequences for the region that the United States needs to be very worried about? 
Yes, Senator, it's a, it's a very important question. Um, thank you, thank you for that. Um, the reason Lebanon remains a, a real priority for the United States is it's, it's just at the intersection of U.S. national security interests in the Middle East. I mean, you've got Israel on, on the southern border, which has to defend itself from Hezbollah. You've got Syria and the instability and war that the brutal dictator Assad has, has fomented. You've got Iran um, supporting through its proxy Hezbollah, destabilizing, uh, destabilizing activity in both Lebanon and the region. We can't ignore any of this. Um, and then there's, of course, the historic ties we have with the Lebanese people. Um, Lebanese are a form a really important part of our diaspora here in the United States and the rich uh, cultural fabric that they, they contribute to. So I, I don't think we can allow Lebanon to reach the worst case scenario, which is why um, we're, we're doing a number of things. I mean, I mentioned several in my opening statement, the humanitarian assistance for the most vulnerable and supporting the Lebanese forces to provide stability while we push Lebanon's leaders to do the necessary things, the hard things they will need to do. I mean, first elect a president, they've got to form a government, uh, that government has got to be capable of bringing in the different parties that are necessary to take the really hard decisions to do the reforms they need to get done for that IMF package. It's the only way out. Um, the presence of Hezbollah poses a huge risk to Israel, but there are at least some potential positives in that the Lebanese government in the past has explored together with Israel whether they might do energy projects in tandem in the Mediterranean. So there, there's not only a need to protect against um, the influence of Hezbollah, but there is the opportunity for some cooperation should the situation in Lebanon stabilize. I, I want to associate myself with the comments you made earlier about the Lebanese armed forces having visited Lebanon, spent time with them, spent time with the U.S. troops that are there training them. They're not perfect, nobody's perfect, but in terms of a a stabilizing force in a nation that desperately needs one, you don't really have many better options if there are any better options than the Lebanese Armed Forces. I agree with you on that. Um, Ambassador Poff, it's good to see you again. Uh, my colleagues and I really enjoyed being with you in Guatemala in the summer of 2021. Uh, and and, and I, I'll, ask, I'll just make one point about Uganda, but then I'm gonna ask you some Guatemala questions since I have you. Um, I, I just want to associate myself with what Senator Murphy said about the need to be really um, active in trying to provide safe haven for LGBTQ Ugandans. We can't dictate the internal politics of a country. That's not what you know, diplomacy is about. But as I've traveled around the world as a member of this committee, often I've heard from LGBTQ activists in countries that were it not for the United States, were it not for the embassy were not for a consulate being a place of safe haven where they could come and dialogue about the, you know, their hopes and aspirations and, and what they hope to contribute to their own countries. If it weren't for the US, there wouldn't be a safe space for them. And um, so while we might not be able to you know, have a huge impact on domestic politics in Uganda, the role of the ambassador is really important in creating a place where people can be treated with equality, uh, the, the, the North Star virtue uh, of this country. So I would just encourage you in that way. Um, when we talk about immigration uh, issues at the border, we often talk about the US-Mexico border, but there's two other really important borders in terms of uh, immigration flows to the United States in the Americas. One is the border between Colombia and Panama, and the other is the border between Guatemala and Mexico. Um, from your experience as the ambassador in Guatemala, how uh, cooperative has Guatemala been in trying to help us deal with immigration issues in the south and north flow at their border with Mexico? Thank you, Senator, for the questions. Uh, first, I just want to make sure I'm very clear. I fully agree with your point on uh, the U.S. Embassy and the U.S. Ambassador's role in supporting all communities, including the LGBTQI uh, community, and if confirmed uh, as ambassador to Uganda, I would be uh, chief of mission that would be engaged with that community and continuing uh, to have an active regular dialogue with them, as I have done so in Guatemala. Uh, in regards to your question uh, about the border of Guatemala uh, and their border security measures, they have been partners uh, effectively, not only with their border with Mexico, which is, as you note, a very important uh, transit point for uh, migrants headed north to our southwest border, as well as their border with Honduras. Uh, they've been effective at, on different occasions of stopping mass movements of individuals, including caravans, uh, but also in working with us and U.S. law enforcement in particular uh, to counter 
the alien smugglers and the human traffickers and the individuals who have been are criminally taking advantage of migrants uh, and unfortunately putting posi- people in positions of great uh, risk and danger. Th- and- thank you. I'm going to need to. I'm a minute over, so I want to cede time to my colleagues, but Certainly. I appreciate that answer. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Senator Ricketts. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to start by echoing what uh, Chairman Murphy and Ranking Member Young said to say thank you for your service to our country and the sacrifices that you and your families make to be able to serve our great nation. It's, it's appreciated, and you all uh, should be congratulated on being nominated for these posts. Uh, Ambassador Johnson, I'm going to start with you. As This is the 70th anniversary of Israel, one of our closest friends in the world and certainly in the region. And Israel, since its inception, has endured attacks from state actors and non-state actors, most recently Hamas, we talked about Hezbollah, uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, um, the Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, just to name a few. And I had the opportunity to see this personally when I was in Israel earlier this year. Uh, when you, can, you can see how small a country is when you fly in a helicopter, you can see the ocean on one side and the Syrian border on the other side. And we were at the Lebanese border where Hezbollah had been digging tunnels through solid limestone for 10 years to be able to get inside Israel and attack them. And, um, you know, that. Uh, then, of course, during the uh, Passover in early April, Israel endured the last, largest rocket attack coming from Lebanon since the Lebanese war in 2006. And obviously, this is all being encouraged by it's either being done by Hamas or Islamic Jihad and certainly encouraged by the IRGC. So what can we do to prevent southern Lebanon from becoming a staging area for these types of rocket attacks on Israel? Um, Thank you, Senator, for your question. I I share your deep concern with the attacks that have been emanating on on Israel, both from Lebanon and more recently from from Gaza. the United States commitment to Israel's security is absolutely ironclad, and Israel will continue to exercise its inherent right to self-defense. But we have to do more. Um, the Lebanese have to do more. Um, Hezbollah, there are a number of ways that we have been targeting Hezbollah um, since 2005, over 200 sanctions on, on individuals and entities going after their finances, and that is important in terms of their ability to access weapons. I understand that they are that Hezbollah is under financial stress, economic stress due to some of these sanctions. Um, We've been able to enlist some of our partners in the Gulf, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Qatar, to join us in these sanctions. Uh, Just last week, the FBI seized 13 internet domains of Hezbollah, which is another way to try to cut off their support. Um, We do continue very much to support UNIFIL's mission in southern Lebanon. Um, UNIFIL has played an effective role in in monitoring the cessation of hostilities uh, since the 2006 war between Israel and Lebanon, um, and also plays a a stabilizing role along on the blue line with their reporting activities, and especially the ability of the peacekeepers to get in there and defuse tense situations. Now, I'm not going to say that they've been able to fully implement their mandate. They have not. Um, They have been prevented from accessing key areas of concerns, like the tunnels that you mentioned. Um, If confirmed, I would call on the Lebanese authorities to to uphold their responsibility to allow UNIFIL to operate in all the areas necessary to fulfill their mandate. And we also need to continue to work with Lebanese Armed Forces to do more joint patrols and have a stronger presence in southern Lebanon. I do think those things will, will help. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, 10 years to dig the tunnels through the solid limestone. It was a very loud, noisy process. And as we observe from our, the Israeli side of the border, Hamas is still there. I mean, they're still there watching us. Uh, and obviously, uh, Lebanon's got 75% of its population is in poverty. They haven't had a president in six months or whatever it is. Very complicated. The economy's in meltdown. My understanding is the Iran uh, foreign minister was there recently to talk, uh, really start trying to get their candidate, Suleiman Frangia, to be the new president. What would that mean if Suleiman Frangia was actually the new president of Lebanon? How would that impact our relations with Lebanon and relations with how Lebanon was going to um, interact with Israel. Uh, Senator, thank you for the question. I share your concern about Iran's malign influence in in Lebanon, um, including through Hezbollah. Um, What we have been continuing to advocate is that the Lebanese parliament is going to have to choose the next 
president. It's not for the international community to decide. But we've really expressed the qualities that we believe are important. Someone that's free, for, free from corruption, someone that can unite the country, that puts the interests of the people first, that can build a coalition to implement the reforms. Um, some, some candidates will not meet that, will not meet that bar. Um, we have been very clear with, with uh, all across Lebanese political spectrum that that's what needs to happen. Um, we've been delivering a, a united message with our partners, um, with France, with Saudi Arabia, with Qatar. Uh, we share the same goal, and, and it's, it's the one that I've stated. All right, so real briefly, because I've already run out of time, too. Uh, what's your analysis of the political stalemate? Where does it go? I'm an optimist, Senator. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, everything I read leads me to believe they're getting closer. Uh, they're getting closer. I just, uh, they need to assume the urgency that the situation demands. This is, it's really time for the Lebanese leaders and political leadership to step up. Uh, electing the president is just the first step. Uh, it gets us to, to some of those next stages where we need to form a government that's, that's capable of, of providing services to the people, that can operate transparently, that puts corruption in, in the rearview mirror. Um, the reforms are, are not going to be easy, um, I, won't, I won't lie, but it, they really have to do it to, to secure that, that World Bank loan and get some necessary liquidity into the economy. So electing the president's the first step, but, but it's, a, it's a path and they're going to need our support. Great. Thank you, Ambassador. We don't, we don't generally make pessimists ambassadors, but we, don't, we definitely don't send pessimists to Lebanon. So. <laughs> <laughs> Senator, uh, Senator Booker. Um, I'm deferring to Senator Booker. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Senator Booker. And, uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congratulations uh, to all of you on your nominations, and thank you for your, your service um, as part of the, the Foreign Service. Uh, and let me start um, with you, I Ambassador Johnson. And uh, on Lebanon, you write, you have to be an optimist. Um, and I think you were there 20 years ago. Uh, Senator Murphy and I were there in 2021. Uh, on a trip, uh, and as I look at the situation today, uh, not that much has changed since our trip in 2021, and maybe it hasn't changed that much in, in 20 years, but let me, let me look to the future a little bit. Um, when Senator Murphy and I were last there, it was just as they were coming out of the last political crisis and, and forming a new government for a little while. Now they're back in a political crisis. Um, but Salome, uh, as you know, uh, Mr. Salome, I think, has been the head of the central bank for a very long time. Uh, he's been indicted um, in many European countries, I believe. I also understand that his tenure will come to an end on June 30th. Um, is that correct? Uh, and what would his departure mean for the opportunity to try to deal with some of the reform and corruption issues? Um, Senator, thank you very much for the question. Yes, his, his term is coming to an end. I, I think it's in July, but I, I would stand to be corrected. Um, I believe it's also up to the president of Lebanon to appoint the next central bank governor. So all the more reason that we need uh, to, to have the Lebanese parliament uh, get a president in place. But we're very much looking forward to uh, working with whoever the Lebanese decide the next central bank governor will be. That person will be critical um, in undertaking the reforms necessary to get to that IMF package. Probably chief among them is the restructuring of the, of the banking sector. Got it. Um, on the electricity situation, I apologize if you already covered this territory uh, before I arrived, but uh, that, of course, has been a chronic problem. Uh, the, the limits on electricity um, each day in Lebanon. Uh, our current ambassador, Ambassador Shays, um, came up with an innovative idea uh, some time ago uh, to help Egypt, Egypt produce some electricity that would be transported uh, through Jordan, Syria, and on to Lebanon. Uh, there were a number of issues uh, that obviously had to be resolved uh, to make sure it was compliant with the Caesar Act. But my question now is, I understand that the main hang-up now is the fact that uh, Lebanon is not conformed to the World Bank proposals. Am I, is that correct? Uh, largely correct, Senator. Um, where we're at, I mean, two hours of electricity a day, you can't run a business on that, much less a, a, an economy or a, or a country. So it, it's been very important to the U.S. government to push for long-term sustainable energy solutions for Lebanon. Um, chief among those has been discussion of a natural gas deal from Egypt um, and an electricity deal with Jordan that would be financed by the World Bank. So where Lebanon's at right now, as, as, as you noted, is there are a number of kind of reforms that need to be done of the sector to get them to that World Bank loan, and they're close. <clears throat> I would actually 
like to commend some of the progress they've made. One is they raised electricity tariffs for the first time in over 30 years. Um, that's an important part of the cost recovery plan requirement. Uh, they've also advertised in The Economist magazine for uh, an, a regulator, regulator authority. So they've taken a number of the steps that would be necessary for that World Bank loan, and they're getting close. But they need to complete those reforms uh, so that the World Bank can, can vote on, on that loan. No, I thank you. I appreciate that. And um, uh, everything we can do, of course, to push them uh, in the right direction uh, would be helpful to the people of Lebanon. I should say, while we're on Lebanon, uh, I do believe we have... Uh, two treasurers there, both in the American University of Beirut and the Lebanon University. Uh, I just met with uh, the president of the latter, and uh, they are sort of islands of hope um, in the middle of a pretty desperate situation. Um, very quickly, if I could uh, turn to you, Mr. Musinga, and it's good to see you in person, uh, having talked to you, uh, I think, via, via Zoom. Um, and obviously a very delicate situation uh, in Ethiopia. Um, a number of the surrounding countries, um, the African Union uh, and the United States have worked hard to get the very fragile peace agreement. What is your current assessment of that situation? And you know, if confirmed, one of your really most important jobs will be to try to make sure we nurture that, that agreement, and make sure that it's sustainable going forward. So what do you see as the biggest challenge uh, at this time? Uh, thank you, Senator, for the question. Um, to be succinct, I think the biggest challenge going forward is the economic situation. Um, we've seen a tremendous progress in cementing uh, the cessation of hostilities and some progress in establishing um, a uh, reconciliation effort as well as um, transitional justice. Uh, if confirmed, it would be uh, among my highest objectives to continue nurturing those two um, processes to move forward. But at the same time, we have to be clear-eyed and recognize that the, the people of Ethiopia are facing a very difficult economic situation, which has been worsened enormously by the drought um, that is impacting the entirety of the, of the Horn and, of course, the conflict itself. Um, but make no mistake, moving ahead um, in continuing to cement the peace uh, which has been uh, hard won through efforts by the international community, the regional community, and the United States, would be top on my list. Thank you. I look forward to supporting all your nominations. Uh, congratulations. Thank you. Senator Booker. Mr. Masingo, you and I have a com commonality besides being bald black men. Uh, we uh, both have deep roots in Louisiana. And there's no reason for me saying that besides the fact that I want to recognize. Uh, I really want to go to another place. Interestingly enough, I found out I have roots to uh, from having my DNA tested, which is Sierra Leone. Uh, there was this interesting uh, 2020 study that showed that uh, views of China are going down significantly uh, in their political and economic partnership, while views of the United States are actually going up. And I'm wondering, is there something we can learn there as we have a bit of a rivalry on the African continent uh, for uh, 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 influence uh, in, in, uh, in the continent as a whole. What, what, what can we learn from Sierra Leone in that sense? Well, I'd say a couple of things, Senator. First and foremost, China has not helped itself. It has done immense damage to its reputation in Sierra Leone through its own actions. Its continued engagement in illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing off of the Sierra Leonean coast, its continued illegal logging in Sierra Leone's forests, its continued pursuit of mineral agreements that violate both international best practice and Sierra Leone's own environmental and labor standards um, have, frankly, left a bad taste in a lot of Sierra Leoneans' mouths towards uh, what China brings to the table. But I think, complementary to that, what my colleagues at the embassy have done uh, is really to carry forward America's story and to try to offer real alternatives to what the People's Republic of China is putting on the table. I think to the work that the Development Finance Corporation has done there in looking at projects that they can support American investment in. I think of the work that the Millennium Challenge Corporation has done very importantly in trying to deliver um, first the initial threshold projects and now hopefully a full compact for the people of Sierra Leone, which would be transformational uh, in terms of its infrastructure. So I think it's a combination of the people of Sierra Leone learning the realities of dealing with the People's Republic of China, but also our own ability to offer alternatives for, uh, for the country's development. I, I appreciate that. And uh, if confirmed, how do you think we can do further double down on those development of economic interests between uh, Sierra Leone setting a standard in a sense? 
Yeah, if confirmed, Senator, one of my top priorities will be to work with the American business community to try to make sure that they are actively engaged in helping Sierra Leone shape its future. I believe there are immense opportunities for investment across the board uh, in Sierra Leone, and certainly with the investments that we've made through the Development Finance Corporation and the Millennium Challenge Corporation, there are going to be opportunities for U.S. business that frankly can benefit not just Sierra Leone, but also benefit us back home in the United States. So if confirmed, I would work very closely with those private sector elements, uh, private sector elements of the U.S. Uh, US that is present in Sierra Leone, and also try to bring to the table an even more active development finance corporation, an even more active MCC, an even more active trade development authority to make sure that we're actively offering those alternatives to what China is trying to still sell to the Sierra Leonean government. I'm really grateful. Ms. Escorgina, how are you? I feel like you've been left out as well in this conversation. I'm not sure if you were happy about that or were you? Uh, <laughs> um, I'm, uh, I'm uh, uh, one of the uh, Senate founding members of the Abraham Accords Caucus here, and I'm very concerned about, uh, sort of, are very hopeful about the possibility of normalizing relations going on in, uh, in, in Oman. And so I'm, I'm wondering, uh, how does Oman view, in your opinion, the, the potential benefits uh, of build, building relations with Israel, uh, potential risks, and what kind of role can you play? Thank you, Senator. As someone who has lived and worked in the region for the better part of 20 years, let me say I think the Abraham Accords is one of the most positive developments we've seen in a generation. And if confirmed, I would certainly work to make the case to our Omani partners to uh, consider uh, normalization with Israel and participation in regional fora like the Negev Forum. Oman is no stranger to this type of diplomacy, hosting since 1996 the, uh, the longest lasting regional mechanism that has included Israel, the Regional Desalination Center. Oman has hosted three uh, visits from Israeli prime ministers, most recently in 2018. And of course, in February, Oman agreed to Israeli overflight, which has opened up new trade routes from Israel to Asia. So if conformed, I would look forward to hitting the ground and uh, working with my team to see how we can make the case with our Omani partners for pursuing normalization. Well, I look forward to trying to help uh, from the Senate side and perhaps work with you to continue to expand that. Uh, Mr. Pop, I, a lot's been discussed uh, already. Uh, you know, Uganda's frustrating to me because there are just a lot of human rights issues that are, that are really uh, um, pressing. Uh, the State Department's latest human rights report documented serious restrictions of political rights and civil society, unlawful killings, forced disappearances, uh, and even torture by state agencies, uh, parts of Uganda's, uh, Uganda's government. Um, I add to that, Senator Murphy already uh, pointedly expressed uh, concerns about a stunning a law that's going to undermine our, our efforts uh, and the successes we have through PEPFAR uh, in the region. Um, uh, you know, they, they have an important role for this. Our bilateral relationship is really important when it comes to uh, United States interests, its regional interests in that area, uh, promoting uh, democracy, human rights, but also just general security issues. And it's just a very difficult balance. Could you uh, maybe uh, address that, that the concerns I have for a government that started out so hopeful uh, years ago and now seems to be slipping towards a behavior uh, that is demonstrably uh, 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 violent, unjust, and undemocratic? Thank you, Senator. Yes, uh, you sum it up very clearly and accurately. I think the concern uh, is that that Uganda is headed in a direction that is not good for Ugandans and all of these areas. Uh, and as f friends of, of Uganda and the region and of the, the people of Uganda, we should be clear about uh, where those challenges are, be clear-eyed in how we assess ways to, to work forward uh, with civil society, uh, with other stakeholders in the country. Obviously, issues of torture, violence, those types of uh, abuses have to be rejected completely and clearly uh, in our diplomacy, in our conversations and discussions uh, with uh, the host government, and also uh, find ways to support uh, increases in democratic space instead of restrictions. Uh, that 
is everything from building uh, space for NGOs and for organizations that are advocating uh, for all of the communities that are facing challenges. It includes uh, making sure that we're talking uh, with all stakeholders in the country, including the political opposition, so that we're hearing very clearly about ways to find solutions uh, going forward uh, to change, hopefully, in a, in a constructive way, the trajectory that uh, Uganda is on. At the same time, as you note, there is uh, a number of areas where Uganda has previously been an important uh, partner on uh, security and regional stability. And of course, we want to try to continue to find ways to work in those areas, because it's an area that uh, faces a lot of challenges, as we've seen even recently. And with the chair's indulgence, a comment and a quick question, and, a, and then a final comment. The quick question, yes or no, do you, do you plan on meeting with um, LGBTQ leaders in Uganda, civil uh, society groups that, that are advocating uh, for the protection and the safety and security of the LGBTQ community there? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. And then the comment is just to the five of you. Uh, you know, these are uh, committee hearings we have often when it comes to confirming ambassadors. I just want to say thank you. My intention is to support each of you on the floor. Uh, it's a tremendous sacrifice, and many of you had a career doing this remarkable work. When I travel around from uh, Lebanon to the subcontinent of Africa, I, I'm just in awe of the commitment, not just of our ambassadors there, but also their staffs as well, and the families of folks. So to the families behind everyone, thank you, and to the uh, five extraordinary uh, servants of this country, I just give you my gratitude. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Booker. The ranking member and I are going to hold you here for a short second round of questions, and I'll turn it over to Senator Young. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Ms. Uh, Escrohima, Oman is uh, uh, essential in efforts to constructively engage with uh, Iran uh, while also providing a check on its malign influences in the region. I'm, I'm thinking here about uh, Iranian harassment of, of commercial shipping vessels, uh, but uh, uh, there are, uh, of course, other areas uh, in which uh, Oman has been and can be helpful moving forward. How will you work with the Omani government and private sector to encourage stronger compliance within Oman with U.S. sanctions on uh, Iran? Thank you for the question, Senator. As you noted, our security relationship with Oman is strong. It dates back four decades and includes military access, uh, joint exercises. We've stepped up maritime interdictions in the Gulf that has denied the flow of lethal aid uh, to, to the Houthis. And uh, certainly this is an ongoing conversation and if uh, confirmed, I would look forward to arriving and uh, checking with my team and seeing what more we can do. And uh, I, you have my pleasure that I will ensure that Oman is compliant with all relevant sanctions. It's a good idea, consulting with your team. I do it a lot, so I, I, I understand. And, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll look forward to following that important work. I'd like to get your views on, on Oman's efforts to promote regional peace, and, uh, regional peace and, and, and the Abraham Accords. It's clear that Oman favors engagement over confrontation, even with countries whose interests don't completely align. I was encouraged to learn of Oman permitting overflights of Israeli carriers earlier this year. And uh, in your testimony, you refer referred to uh, the, the Mideast Desalinization Research Center. Um, however, Oman has yet to pursue normalization with Israel. In your view, what are the primary reasons for Sultan uh, Haitham's uh, hesitation in having Oman join the Abraham Accords? And if confirmed, how would you advocate for Oman to finally take this step. Thank you for raising this, Senator. Um, it is true, Oman's commitment to mediation and de-escalation in the region makes it a vital partner in many of our efforts uh, to engage in diplomacy, to depressurize and de-escalate tensions in the region. And uh, the Omanis have told us that uh, they would like to see more progress on the uh, Israeli-Palestinian track of peace negotiations before uh, looking at pursuing uh, normalization with Israel. And we, of course, keep our Omani partners briefed up on our efforts uh, in that regard. And at the same time, I think it's important to continue making the case for the regional integration and economic benefits of pursuing normalization with Israel as we begin to see the impact of the Abraham Accords and the Negev Forum and the, the, the benefits that are accruing uh, to states who are participating. Thank you. 
Ambassador Johnson, you may recall that last year, Senator Van Holland and I urged Secretary Blinken and the administration to engage with Lebanon to ensure fairness and transparency in its parliamentary election. Lebanon, uh, nonetheless, appears no closer to having a complete government uh, due to its inability to elect a president. I know it's a very thorny issue, but if confirmed, what U.S. and multilateral policies would you support to help build consensus and finally break this political impasse? Well, Senator, yes, um, I very much share your concern about the stalled presidential election. Um, as, as I've mentioned, Lebanon needs to elect a president so they can move forward on the reforms toward the IMF package. So we have to leverage, if confirmed, I would leverage all diplomatic tools to continue to push all sectors within Lebanon, all political leaders, to step up and do what they need to do for the Lebanese people. Um, and for parliament to elect a president. And the way we're going about this, um, Ambassador Shea discusses all the time with all the leaders on the ground. Our Assistant Secretary for Near Eastern Affairs, Barbara Leaf, was just in Beirut in March. Um, we've been meeting with our international partners. You mentioned the multilateral effort. And we thank very much the efforts of France, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Qatar, who partnered with us in the meeting in, in Paris in February to deliver a united message to the Lebanese political leadership. So if confirmed, I would continue to use those, those tools, pressing across all spectrums of Lebanese society, but also ensuring we deliver that unified message with our international partners. Uh, thank you for your response. I, I, I uh, have one more line of questioning for you, and it, it pertains to Hezbollah. Um, if confirmed, would you meet with uh, leaders of Hezbollah? Um, no, Senator, I would not. They, uh, Hezbollah is a U.S. designated terrorist organization. Will you work with ministries run by Hezbollah or its allies? Senator, I think we have been very careful. I, I would like to point to we have sanctioned members of parliament and allies in parliament for their ties to Hezbollah. I think we are raising the costs for anyone of doing business with Hezbollah or seeking closer ties. And I, I think it has sent a strong warning um, to others. It certainly complicates our diplomacy uh, if key ministries are, are held by, by ministers who are allied to Hezbollah. How should the U.S. deal with, with um, Lebanese parties or politicians uh, that align themselves with Hezbollah? Um, Senator, we, we do have uh, tools that we can leverage to deal with that, and I would be committed to using those tools uh, when there is evidence um, that the interagency in the United States could pursue. Can you elaborate on the tools? Um, I think, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, our sanctions tools have been very, very effective in, in going after and designated over, over 200 individuals and entities. Some of these are, are on the financial side. Some of these are facilitators. Some of these are um, weapon smugglers. Some of these are drug traffickers. So there have been many ways we've been able to get at the things that, that enable Hezbollah to continue its illicit and terrorist activities. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Hunt, sort of end my, my questions uh, with you, sir. Uh, the mining sector is a crucial part of Sierra Leone's economy, but local Sierra Le Leoneans don't seem to be reaping the benefits of, of many of the large-scale projects. China sponsored gold mining operations, uh, and uh, those have had a, a particularly brutal impact on Sierra Leone's land, their water. How would you promote responsible and sustainable mining practices that benefit both Sierra Leone and, and uh, international investors? Senator, it's, there's no question that the PRC has blatantly ignored Sierra Leone's own environmental and labor standards while it has carried out its mining projects in Sierra Leone. The Sierra Leonean people uh, from what we can tell based upon polling that your colleague referenced, have very clearly taken, are very clearly of the opinion that the PRC is not a trusted partner in this sector. So from my perspective, if confirmed, what I would attempt to do is to try to help identify trusted partners. 
primarily from the United States or other Western allies who are prepared to follow the various international regimes that are in place to ensure best practices in the mining sector. And that who, who would you work with as, as you look to identify trusted certainly private sector partners? Yes, sir. Ideally, I would hope to work with the U.S. Foreign Commercial Service first and foremost to see if we have private sector American businesses that can provide the technology and the investment that Sierra Leone needs. In the absence of that, I would turn to our closest friends and allies, the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, who have well-established uh, well-established sectors, mining sectors in their economy. Sierra Leone has made efforts to uh, attract foreign investment, uh, improve its business environment. What measures would you support to encourage U.S. companies uh, to invest in, in Sierra Leone uh, beyond what you've indicated uh, you'd do as it pertains to uh, trusted mining partners? And uh, how would you address any concerns related to bureaucracy, corruption, or, or, or legal protections for investors? Certainly, Senator. I think it's a very important question. When I think about how best to attract investment to Sierra Leone, if confirmed, first and foremost, I would look to the Sierra Leone diaspora in the United States. Uh, there are many of our own citizens who have deep ties to the country, a deep interest in its future, and have expressed an interest already in coming and investing there. Secondly, I would want to talk to those who are looking to invest, as well as those who already have businesses in Sierra Leone, to understand the obstacles that they are facing in engaging in trade and investment in the Sierra Leone economy. In the past, in various posts where I have served in leadership roles, I've been an active advocate for the reduction of bureaucracy, the reduction of obstacles, the implementation of international best practices, and if confirmed, I would hope to do that uh, as ambassador to Sierra Leone in close concert with the rest of our country team and the various agencies that have been set up in the U.S. government to support U.S. businesses working overseas. Thank you, sir. Thank you all, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Young. I I'm just, this panel reminds me of how well served we are at the State Department. You're, we're all asking you questions as if you are already at posts, um, as if you are intimately familiar with these countries, and you are answering the questions as if you're already there, which just tells us how well suited you are for these roles, how well trained you are, um, and how lucky we are to have you. Um, uh, just, I have two final wrap-up questions. Um, in the vein of uh, maybe asking an unfair question to a nominee who's not on the ground yet, um, I wanted to ask you, uh, Mr. Masinga, uh, about um, how the U.S. has viewed Abe. I mean, this is remarkable. We go from Nobel Prize to civil war, you know, within 12 to 18 months. Um, we're celebrating him as a statesman who's willing to set aside grievance to make peace with his neighbors. And some critics of our policy will say that we kind of misread the core political dynamics in the country and that our support for Abe ended up underwriting um, his confrontational approach with his rivals, um, uh, including um, the TPLF. And so um, I just wonder what you think, in hindsight, was our assessment of Abe off? Did we make a mistake to make this bet? Did we end up providing him with cover to allow him to engage in the kind of tactics that have gotten us to this sort of moment of crisis? Uh, Senator Murphy, um, in response to that question, let me start with where we are now and then maybe loop back towards, towards uh, the historical part you're talking about. The U.S. understands and regards all actors, um, all leaders in Ethiopia through a clear-eyed lens. Um, Ethiopia did not arrive at the position where it is now and, and the, the horrendous conflict that we've seen in recent years um, accidentally. There were many factors that uh, led and contributed to this conflict, and the, the conflict was pitiless. Um, and the leaders that were associated with that conflict um, uh, we all understand and, and, and see them clearly and see all the dynamics very clearly for what they are. Having said that, they are the leaders of the country, and so we uh, will work with them um, intensively to rebuild the country. We are seeing enormous energy and optimism amongst uh, many of the former combatants 
to stitch that country together. And Senator, I look forward to uh, working with them and all of you in that endeavor if confirmed. Um, going back to your, your somewhat difficult question, um, probably there was some level of excessive optimism. Um, however, um, our engagement with uh, Ethiopia over many years has been deep um, and intense due, f due to uh, the size of our diaspora, a very uh, important diaspora in the country, and the love that many Americans have for Ethiopia, the size of that country, uh, and the importance of the, that country in Africa and in, in the region. Um, uh, going forward again, um, I, as ambassador, if confirmed, We'll look forward to working with all of you um, and all stakeholders to recognize um, through a clear-eyed, again, uh, manner, um, the stakes involved and to help that country move forward. You know, optimists sometimes have a hard time learning lessons because we believe that if there are obstacles in the past, they don't need to be obstacles in the future. We can just do a, a better and more innovative and more thorough job of surmounting them the next time we meet them. Um, the U.S. is particularly bad at learning lessons, in part because we don't believe that there's any barrier that we can't surmount. And so I just ask that question to make sure that as we try to push forward with our friends and our partners in Ethiopia, that we're also looking backwards as well. Final question, um, Ambassador, uh, um, I want to talk to you just a, a bit more about Lebanon. just want to talk to you a little bit about what you know regarding Hezbollah's um, propaganda and information ability. I mean, it was pretty stunning to me when I was there with Senator Van Hollen. Um, as was mentioned, you know, we put on the, ta the, the table this very innovative program to try to get gas delivered to Lebanon from Egypt. And this was an initiative that the United States was leading on. And yet it was a liability for us when we were there because Hezbollah had let people know that, in fact, it was the United States that was stopping this initiative, that the Caesar sanctions were the only thing standing in the way of Egyptian gas getting to Lebanon. And that was the narrative that was the dominant narrative, not that the United States is trying to find innovative, creative means to get gas to Lebanon, but that the United States is standing in the way of gas getting to Lebanon. It just feels to me that we are completely uh, outgunned and outmanned when it comes to Hezbollah's effort to spin a narrative compared to our embassy and our State Department's ability to tell the real story of what's going on. I'm not initially looking for a full diagnosis of what's wrong with U.S. information operations, but this is a capability that Hezbollah has that's serious and has to be confronted, correct? Uh, absolutely, Senator. I, I agree with you. Um, the disinformation is is dangerous and and seeks to undermine our objectives and the good work we're doing together with our, our Lebanese partners. It's just, it, it shows, I mean, two things. The most important is the need for very active, proactive public diplomacy on the part of the U.S. government. If confirmed, I would very much look forward to a very active, forward-leaning public diplomacy program in Lebanon. One thing Lebanon does have is a very vibrant press corps. <laughs> so I, I think there are many opportunities to get our story out. Um, at the same time, we have to counter the disinformation that is out there. Um, not the only way to do it, but I was, I was heartened by the creative seizure by the FBI of the 13 internet domains last week, and I would look forward to using all the tools at our disposal um, to, to counter Hezbollah disinformation if confirmed. Great. It's a very important point. Great. Uh, well said. Thank you all for your testimony. We really do appreciate you sticking with us and answering all these tough questions. We're going to allow members to submit questions for the record until the close of business tomorrow. And with thanks to the committee, to our nominees, and to the staff, this hearing is now adjourned.